self-storage owner or operator looking for service providers to help at your facility? Well, the Storage Business Owners Alliance, also known as the SBOA, has you covered. The SBOA is the premier online hub for connecting self-storage owners and operators to industry-leading products and service providers. We provide one-stop shopping for your business with exclusive offers to save time and money. At the SBOA, we believe by coming together, we help owners and operators grow revenue, gain purchasing power, reduce expenses, improve efficiencies, and increase profitability. We also offer many resources such as our conferences and self-storage unlock webinars to help self-storage owners and operators gain the knowledge needed to become more competitive in the industry. To become an SBOA member or to find out more information, please visit www.thesboa.com today. We can't wait for you to join the Alliance. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Thursday. Thank you for joining us again for another Self Storage Unlocks episode. Today, we're gonna to be talking about real estate transactions and how to have the most successful closing possible out there. Before we get started, I wanted to just go over a quick few housekeeping items with you. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a section called polls. If you could take a moment and go over and answer the poll questions for us, we would be more than grateful for you to do that. We'd like to learn about you and your business, so that helps us to get a better gauge of who you are and where you're at in your self-storage uh, journey. And then also the chat area, the comments area, is where you're going to ask your questions live to the experts that we have here with us today. And I would like to actually start introducing them. My first guest with us today is Brett Hatcher from Marcus and Millichap. Hey, Brett. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us and uh, thanks for being here. Brett, give me a rundown of your background, how long you've been in the self-storage industry and what you do in the self-storage industry. Yeah, so I joined Marcus and Millichap in 2006, um, so about 16 years in the uh, self-storage industry, uh, built a team. We have eight agents in Columbus and four out in Palo Alto uh, that canvas the, the U.S., um, you know, strictly self-storage and uh, having some, it's just crazy what's going on with our growth that we've had in the industry and as, as a team and as a company. So uh, yeah, it's exciting. Awesome. Well, thanks for giving us that quick rundown and we're gonna have lots of questions coming your way. Um, I'll bring you back up in just a quick second. I'm gonna bring up our next guest who is Pete Veltri and Pete is from CityLine Capital. Hey, Pete. Hey, Jess, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Glad awesome. to be here. Thanks for being here. And Pete came in at the last minute to help me out. So I'm more than gracious to you for being here today. Uh, Pete, same as Brett, give us a rundown of who you are, how long you've been in the industry and what you're currently doing. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I'm one of the principals at CityLine Capital. I have been there for two years as chief operating officer and general counsel. General counsel stems from my uh, background as a lawyer. Uh, I was at a law firm in Pittsburgh, a large Pittsburgh law firm for 14 years where I focused on real estate law and did, you know, all manner of real estate acquisitions, uh, storage and others, um, and then made the transition um, to CityLine Capital two and a half years ago and have been on the other side of the fence uh, on the acquisition side here. So, Awesome. Well, it sounds like you've had a pretty successful and exciting career thus far. It's been a busy one, that's for sure. <laughs> I think everyone's busy in self-storage. I've actually had a vendor the other day say, stop sending me leads. And I'm like, I'm going to document you saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get started, Pete, I'm going to remove you real quick and bring you guys back up in just a quick second. Uh, we always like to give a shout out and thank you to our partners that help us put these events on. Um, the two that are sponsoring today are the BSC Group and Newmark. Uh, so if you could stay tuned, I have a brief announcement from both of those companies for you. When change is the only constant, ingenuity is the only option. Forging a new way forward demands courage. The courage to defy convention and question tradition. To reimagine the rules and shift the horizon. To make the future happen 
instead of waiting for change. The courage to make an impact on industry, on society, on entire cities. Through agility and tenacity, through engineering the exceptional, through negotiating the impossible. It's the energy that defines us, the spirit of entrepreneurship, the will to evolve and adapt, and the power to turn vision into reality. That's Newmark. The BSC Group provides commercial real estate financing advisory solutions with a specialized niche in self-storage assets. Our team has the experience and expertise in the industry to get you the results you desire. We understand each property presents different challenges, every client brings with them unique situations, and that the financial markets are always changing. The BSC Group team members have completed more than 500 financing transactions valued at over $4 billion for commercial property owners nationwide. Also, the 10-time winner of the Inside Self Storage Best Finance Broker. To learn more about the BSC Group, please call 1-800-605-7880 or visit www.thebscgroup.com. Did anyone recognize that voice? That is mine. I am hireable for voiceovers of all your videos. Just kidding. Um, and actually, our third speaker has finally arrived. I'm going to bring Jeremiah up to the screen with me. Hey, Jeremiah. Hey, hey, guys. How can are you? Good, I can hear good. you. Yeah. Good, good, good. Hey, we, you know, we, we love virtual because it can be easy. We don't have to travel, but we also get nervous with virtual because we can have technical difficulties, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mike's working. Good. Good deal. Awesome. Well, Jeremiah, I just wanted to introduce you to the group. You're from Patriot Holdings. Can you give us a rundown about who you are, how long you've been doing self-storage? And you've got some pretty cool stuff going on. I know you've got a fund. You just released a book. Like, tell the audience who you are. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Uh, so sure. I've been in real estate 20 years. I, I originally was in the manufactured housing space, and I still am exiting that space now. And it's it's a good place to be. But for me, I'm I'm all in. I love storage. I've been in storage the last seven eight years. Uh, I grew up in New England as a kid. So I, I but I live out in Vegas. So I uh, I actually started investing and developing back in my home states in New Hampshire and in Vermont and Maine and Massachusetts. So now I'm, I'm pretty, pretty much, uh, you know, heavily, heavily invested in building a portfolio in the Northeast. And uh, I think right now, ground up has kind of been my primary focus. So I've been developing a lot, but, but also a lot of acquisitions. So we have, I think, 65 sites now. And I think we acquired like uh, 30 some odd sites last year. So we definitely have some transactional volume. And I'm happy to share, you know, the, the best ways that I try to make a transaction nice and smooth to make the deal, you know, seamless for everybody. Cool. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to bring up our fellow panelists and we're going to get this thing kicked off. All right, guys. So my first question for everyone, I think everyone on the call this here was at ISS last week, right? Yep. Yeah. I so wasn't, I, I was I not provided in Concord. So I was in Orlando. <laughs> oh, well, that's, we sent a contingency. That's good. We had a contingency in Vegas, but I wasn't there. Oh, yeah, it was a it was a long week, but it was a good week. So I heard some, you know, interesting stats as it relates to like the real estate industry and everything going on in commercial real estate. So the first topic that I wanted to bring up is inflation. Inflation is running rampant. My goodness, gas prices are high. Uh, food prices are high. You go to the grocery store, you can't even get certain groceries. They're not even on the shelves anymore. So Let's talk to the audience a little bit about how inflation is going to have an impact on commercial real estate and the buying and selling process. I can jump in here. Uh, you know, ahead, I, I, I think when uh, obviously when they say there's inflation, it, it means the rent there's rent growth within the market, and and that's a great thing. So we uh, you know it hedges against it. Real estate's a great play. I'll go out on a, on a ledge here a little bit and say that I think the self storage sector has already sunk in. A lot of the inflation on the rental side. I think when COVID hit and they put in trillions of dollars in the economies directly in the consumer's hands, they spent it. And when they started filling up these storage facilities, everybody got 95% plus. 
we know to raise rent. I mean, the market is much smarter than it used to be and much more in tune with the with the moving of rents. And, we, you know, I was looking at properties in Florida and Nashville that were, you know, for a 10 by 10 was 130, 135 bucks. Oof. But in a year later, they're over 215 a foot or 215 bucks. So I, it really and everybody's full. And, you know, and so I look at that. I say to myself, we've had a big, a big hit on these rents. And at what point do we get when the rents actually get to where the consumer is going to say, all right, $240 for a 10 by 10 in you know, Nashville. I can't do that. So I think we've already hit the inflationary side of the rents. I mean, the rent growth we've seen in the last 18 to 24 months is historic. And so mm-hmm. I, I think obviously it's going to be, it's going to continue. There's always that question of, you know, what if they go, if, you know, somebody goes from a one bedroom to a two bedroom with a roommate, they need a space or a business downsides. You know, that's how we are, re- you know, recession resistant, not proof. So there is always that, that I think we still stay up there. But a lot of our rent, I think our rent growth is going to flatten a little bit in the next coming years. I, I don't think it's going to go down by any means. But I think if you look at the rent growth, we've been, you know, that's what's interesting. I was told, you know, every every meeting in Vegas, you know, 15 straight meetings I talk about when we're underwriting deals. A lot of times you look at the rent growth over time. It was here. And all of a sudden it's gone like this. And everybody's grabbing that window right here and saying, no, look at my rent growth. This is where it's going to be, you know. And we're getting away with it. And, and for all intents and purposes, I think it at least stays there. But the question is, do we continue to go up from left to right? Um, so that that is actually a, a question. Obviously, no one knows. But I do think we're going to see a little bit slowdown of the rent growth because you look at markets like Denver, Dallas, Nashville, Raleigh, Florida. Those rent, those markets were heavily saturated with new development. It's it, it softened the rents for years, and all of a sudden, after Cohen's COVID hit. Boom! It it exploded, and all of a sudden, you go to you know you can go in West Palm Beach as four hundred and fifty bucks for ten by ten, you know it's that that wasn't there. It was three and a quarter before COVID. Not even that. Maybe high twos. And so, I think we've seen a big pop. Will we continue to see it? I think it's going to slow down. I still think that the you know the amount of money chasing deals is still going to be there, and the and the demand. I still think the fundamentals are great, but I think some of our rent growth may slow down a little bit compared to what everybody's predicting because of inflation. So I, I, I'm i very cautious when advising some folks on, you know, the growth that's there. But it's a hard sell when I when I tell somebody a seller and they look at this rent growth and they tell me, you know, with rates going up inflation and I say, we, you know, at some point they've got to stop. I mean, they got to slow down. Everything's cyclical within the real estate market, but they don't want to hear that. They just think everything everybody's got their blinders on and it's just everything is green and green. <laughs> yeah. Pete, Jeremiah, anything to add on inflation and what you think is going to happen over the next, you know, couple months? Because, you know, we're all we're all riding the wave right now, but the, the balloon's going to pop eventually, right? <laughs> it's not going to sustain yeah, so, itself. Yeah, so I, I agree with Brett, right? I think, first off, it's impossible to predict exactly what happens. But, you know, sure. the, the storage industry had a lot of tailwinds with the pandemic, you know, people going to home offices and filling up units. So there was a supply demand factor that did pump up those rates. Now you're getting inflation on top of it. And I think it's an interesting question as to what you're going to see with rates. You know, it's probably less of a question over the next couple of months and more of a question over the next couple of years. Um, but the one the one really interesting thing, though, is the, the perception of storage, at least, is that it's, it's attractive in an inflationary environment because you, you can be more dynamic with your rates, right? If you're someone who's looking to come into and, you know, acquire an office building, and they're, you know, they have long-term leases in place with either no or minimal escalations. That's a that's a tough asset class to be in in that sort of environment if you have an inflationary um, macroeconomic environment. So I think that's one advantage that storage does have. I don't disagree with with Brett that the rates can't keep going up forever, um, but at least you have the ability to be a little more dynamic in how you look at things on a on a month to month, you know, quarter by quarter basis. Yeah, for sure. Jeremiah, how about you? I agree with uh, with both guys in in terms of, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but there's there's a pros and cons to it because we get right now, there's going to be a lot more barriers to entry in the space because values is is Brett and and with Pete doing the the capital stack on it and debt. The values are through the roof. You know, we're seeing in the Northeast, you know, well over 150 bucks a foot now for single story products, some $200 plus a foot. So on the construction side, what we're you know steel 
over the last you know 12 to 24 months when i started building four or five years ago i was buying buildings single story buildings at 10 to 12 bucks a foot erected you know not counting concrete or anything else and now we're, we're lucky to get 20 to 25 dollars a foot for your just your steel and erection so it's doubled in price uh you know my dad owns a paving company i grew up paving so you know right there with the cost of oil and commodities you know paving shot up 30 40 percent concrete went up from you know we started at five or six bucks a foot for our floating slab and now we're at you know i've seen bids at 18 bucks a foot you know double the triple of our cost so i think for for us it's it's a, uh, a blessing and a curse because we want to position ourselves in the marketplace right now to build new products. And then we feel like it's not going to go down in value. Like Brent said, I mean, maybe rents flatten out, but in terms of the cost to build the product, inflation is definitely here to stay and, and material costs, labor. And that's the other thing on the operation side is, you know, wages. I'm sure everybody here has employees or deals with employees. You know, we're not finding labor at the lower end tier anymore. You know, there's a you know, minimum wage now. It, it, for us, it's a quality person's 20 bucks an hour plus. So that's okay. that's across the board. And, and we still deal with day to day management teams, even though we, we manage uh, remotely from a, a hub and spoke model where we, we manage four or five facilities in a region. We still deal with people and labor. So all those costs go up forcing, you know, which we see is a direct reflection of inflation. Yeah, definitely. The labor market, uh, it's pretty interesting what's going on out there. I mean, I've never seen this industry have to give away bonus, sign on bonuses, you know, uh, retention bonuses to the level that they're having to. And yes, definitely that traditional, you know, 12 to $15 an hour employee no longer exists. They're, they can come in, they can get the 18 to $20, like you're saying, Jeremiah, because quite honestly, they're just really hard to find. So all right, so we talked about inflation. Let's talk about cap rates. Cap rates are anticipated to go up. Give me some feedback on what you guys are seeing and feeling about cap rates. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, everybody, that was kind of the discussion in, in Vegas is, is have, we felt, have we felt the decompression of cap rates yet? Um, and, and our team, the Hatcher Co. Group, we have 67 deals in LOI and contract. And I've said this for the last week and a half, knock on wood, we have not had one retrade. Have we had, are we starting to, and a lot of the buyers are taking more interest only, are, you know, taking, put down a little bit more to offset that, eating a little bit less of the cash flow. Um, but I think now that rates have popped 150 base points in January or 130 base points in January, you know, they're looking at it saying, now we have to price it in. You know, when we were in contract and they wrote up a little bit, you know, we just kind of swallowed it. Now they look at it and they're saying, you know, you can't be, you know, how do you make a four and a half cap work when you're borrowing at five if it's a stabilized asset? And there's not a ton of movement. I mean, it does go back to like, you know, and if it was Peter Jeremiah was saying, you could, or yeah, Pete was saying, like, we can move, you can move rents. So obviously, if you're buying that low of a cap rate or even around your interest rate, if it's inverted, you plan on, you know, improving the operations, raising revenue. Um, but you look at historic cap rates. I, I, I look back and I say the peak of the market, I always was said was in, in 2016, in April 2016. And then it kind of was up here and then it just kind of just bounced. And then all of a sudden COVID hit, it dropped a little bit. And then after COVID, it spiked up. And I would say January, early February was probably the peak of the market. I'd say February was the peak of the historic market. And I don't think we'll hit that peak again because it can't drop rates. I mean, that's where, you know, you're getting CMBS debt you know, 75% LTV and you're getting CMBS debt at three, three and a quarter, you know, now you want to get a CMBS loan, it's 5%. So you, you look at the cap rate move, You, I mean, just right there. Now people are moving away from there. We're borrowing off of different, you know, banks and doing some, you know, trying to be creative in order to offset that. So we haven't seen the cap rates decompress like crazy, but we are, you know, because there's a lot of money out there chasing these deals and in paying record numbers right now. So we haven't seen the decompression. Everybody sees that storm kind of looming in, in the distance and it will come. Like until it comes, everybody, I, I think I tell my clients like, listen, I'm gonna be as aggressive as we possibly can when we take stuff out to market. Until I have a retrade, until I start seeing that come, we're gonna go hard because, you know, people are still getting, I mean, you look historic debt, they're still, you know, you can borrow over the sofa or, you know, you can do bank stuff in, you know, the high, mid to high fours right now. That's still very, very cheap equity. We got in this mindset of like two, three percent. That's like I remember when I got in in 16 or in 06, it was like 
six and a quarter, six percent. And everybody we were telling people was that's historically like low interest rates. So I think we haven't seen the decompression of cap rates yet. I think we're we're it's you know the window's closing. I don't know how quickly. My guess is by the Fed's talking about being more aggressive on the next two bumps. And you know, if they go another 50 bips, I, I think it'll slow it down. In my, in my opinion, we'll see it in June, July to where we can see a, a little bit of a move in the market. And there will be there will actually be some impact. I don't feel we've impacted sellers quite yet. I still think the market is red hot. And I don't think it's gonna like, you know, close off by any means in the summer. But I think it could slow down a little bit where, you know, I can't buy it at a four and a quarter cap. I need to get it at a five cap. Well, you know, take that 75%, 75 basis points and an NOI, it's a million dollars here, and it's a million dollars there. It changes the you know the outlook and where sellers are gonna go, you know what, this thing cash flows for me, what am I gonna do with my money? And they're gonna hold it. Because right now the, the offers are almost so crazy, they're like, why wouldn't I sell? Because we've seen the rental growth, the amount of money in there, it's like the perfect storm. That's why I think February is a perfect storm. If you're borrowing around 3%, there's a ton more money than ever has been out there on the market and rents popped over the last 12 months. So it's like all three things work together. That's why we had one of the, we had our highest, our most grossing quarter, uh, first quarter. And our second quarter will be right there. Third and fourth, I'm a little bit nervous on where things could shake out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was talking to somebody the other day and I, they bought over, I think it was over 600,000 on the current asking price just because they wanted it so bad. I mean, when you're spending over half a million dollars more because you want it, that that's that's a testimonial right there. Pete, Jeremiah, do you have anything to add as far as cap rates? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Brett's spot on with his assessment of the market. I think you haven't seen cap rates um, bump up too much yet, but uh, interest rates are certainly going that way. And I think part of the reason is, right, that there's just been such an influx of capital into the market, right, that, that there has just been this steady pressure of cap rates going down and down and down. And now for the first time, you have this counterbalancing force of rising interest rates. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a lag until that happens. Um, but I think what you're going to see is, look, there's a lot of very active buyers out there. We're one of them. We we acquired 77 properties last year. So we're we're in the market routinely. We're, we wow. get, we're under contract on a bunch of deals right now. And we're seeing it, right? Interest rates have widened from when we initially priced it. And, you know, we're holding, you know, we, we understand, you know, for the most part, we're holding if you have a clean deal. Um, you know, historically, you might have been able to eat some things you find in diligence. Now, between if you, if you find things in diligence and interest rates are going up, that might be a conversation with the seller. But I think, you know, we're doing a good job of not retrading, like Brett said. I mean, it's not something you're seeing right now. But people who have that experience who are, you know, seeing, their yields erode with increased interest rates between the time they signed up a deal and the time they close. I think the next round of deals they're looking at, they're going to be pricing that in a little bit. So I think that's when you're going to see later into the second quarter, some cap rates uh, start to rise a little bit as people who have recently gone through that process start to start to adjust accordingly. And, and Brett brought up a good point about debt, uh, but it's actually a sort of a double whammy on debt in some respects, right? You got this rising interest rate and we're actually, you know, proceeds are actually getting a little tighter because you're now constrained by the debt service coverage ratio steps that really historically at the interest rates, you don't have to pay attention to them. You could just focus on debt yield and you were there. And then the debt service coverage ratio was just something you worried about uh, on a going forward basis, making sure you're in compliance with the covenants. But now we're running into that actually being a constraint on proceeds. So in addition to higher interest rates, those rates are actually affecting the, the proceeds because you're you're tighter on that debt service coverage ratio step. So I think it's sort of a, a double factor on on how debt is is going to play a role in this as well. Sure. Yeah, we Jeremiah, see, anything? Yeah, we see, we've seen that as well, Pete. And that I think the that when you ask this question, I think there's tiers of storage asset cl uh, class types. Mm -hmm. So when you know your listeners are on it, I mean, I'm sure there's different levels of sophistication. And man, Brett's team is is spot on. It they're the first people to know. If there's going to be a reflection in the cap rate or not, just with their, their finger on the pulse, they just sold assets for us, some of the smaller assets that we had. And I think to that, to what I, we're seeing directly from boots on the ground is the institutional assets, the, the stabilized, the, the, the larger metro markets, you know, larger facilities, good rates. Um, I'm curious to see how it shakes out where there's a lot of new capital in the space. A lot of traditional commercial real estate funds that were possibly in retail or office or uh, the, the 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 main four multifamily, 
You know, there's pent up. I'm curious how much capital is going to continue to pursue our asset class. I've noticed, though, they, they don't like heavy lifts. You know, if you have a nice stabilized asset like, like Brett puts out to market, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like we don't even have a chance. Forget it. Yeah, these guys, they're, they're willing to take a yield that is much less than what a smaller operator would want to generate a cash on cash and, and especially mm -hmm. our investors. And but yet they look at it like, OK, this is a very recession resistant, solid asset class. Like people saying short term leases, we don't get buried in inflation, low operating costs over the long haul. Right. Not big capex. I mean, you got all these really, really strong attributes of storage where the secret is out, the, the cat's out of the bag. And then with like, you know, massive rent increases over the last year and a half, two years, that really like now put us on the map even more where you're getting 16, 18 dollars gross rents. You're like, you know, used to be storage wasn't the highest and best use for a site. Now you're like, wow, you're not going to build a shopping center here anymore. Storage is the highest and best use. So to bring it back to your question is with the cap rates, what we're noticing, though, on smaller projects that are 10, 20, 30, 40,000 square feet that are in suburban or tertiary markets, you know, our banks are softening. So the New England, a lot of community banks or uh, credit unions, these banks are saying, hey, hold on, we're lowering your loan to value. We're, we, like Pete was saying, higher debt coverage ratio, less proceeds. So that that affects returns immediately, right? The debt does. So I'm curious how that's going to shake out in the lower tier assets. And, and I haven't seen it yet, though. It's still very competitive. But, you know, systemically, it's changing on the dynamics of the deal because these the, the lenders are getting more cautious on our end, especially when you're dealing with construction or any other moving parts. So I think what we're, my, my, my uh, anticipation is that the, the lower tier asset classes under the 40, 50,000 square feet in suburban markets, I think they're going to take a little dip first before you know, any other institutional class assets. I think there's a lot of room there for investors to continue to keep cap rates tight on the high end. But then on the flip side, you're seeing institutions now come into lower tier assets. Now, you know, Merritt Hill's coming into like our small market. And we were just so surprised to see that, that they would pay what they paid and traditionally what they would never be there. So I'm curious and I don't want to take this whole conversation to another direction. But down the road, you know, if, if these guys think that that institutions are going to start going, reaching out of their markets and driving cap rates down in traditionally, you know, higher cap rate markets. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you say that because we have seen, you know, a lot of these buyers spread, you know, spread out and, and go into tertiary markets where they have their driving cap rates down. And it's it's been crazy. And actually, somebody sent me a, this little like C property in the C market of Ohio today. And they and my analyst, five analysts, they all deal with a lot of deals every day. And he sent it to me. And it was like a five and a half cap. I'm like, this is a seven cap. I know this is like maybe last year I was probably a six and a half. Now we're going to be at a seven. They're like. We've got to build that in because it's, you know, it needs work. It's in a small market. It's, a you know, it's 20,000 square feet. So I definitely agree with Jeremiah. You're going to see that market take the first dip. Um, and the, the cores aren't going to be affected to the end. And, but, you know, at some point they will be as well. And it's interesting, Pete, like I've heard debt coverage ratio, like it's like every day now. Like and when I got into business, you used to hear that, you know, debt coverage ratio, 1.2, like, and, and, you know, I was at dinner with KKR last night and, and we were all talking about that too. It's like, that's the new thing that you actually have to pay attention to that we were, and some of my younger brokers who, you know, been doing this for four or five years, they didn't even know, they don't even know what it is because it's just been, it's debt yield. Everything was debt yield. And now it's like, wait, what's this? So it is, it's like the buzzword that goes around now. Yeah. The first, the first time it came up on one of our deals, we were sort of blindsided like, wait, why are proceeds light? I'm like, oh, that thing we haven't paid attention to in the last three years. Now we have to start looking at it again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hey, we've got a question from the audience. I'm going to pop it here up on the screen and read it out loud. This is from Eric Sweet. Great discussion on the rates. With the position that occupancy drives rates, what do you believe are the major triggers that will threaten our current historic occupancy levels? That's an interesting one because, I mean, I, I obviously it's just <laughs> Well, we see a pullback in the demand for for storage if we slide into a recession. You know, I, I, like Jamie Dimon made a statement that, you know, we're going to see rates go up. It's going to put us into a recession and then they're going to have to dial back the rates a little bit and, and to like soften. But I think to stop the speeding train of inflation, something significant needs to happen. We're we're trying to apply the brakes slowly here by raising the rates. But if 
they hit it twice hard. All of a sudden, you know, with everything that's going on between logistics nightmares, the oil prices, the war, there's a lot of things that can actually throw us into a recession where people start actually thinking, you know, like maybe I don't need that. And the other thing I was talking with public storage two days ago, and they their um, their delinquent rates are starting to spike higher than they've seen in the last five years. I'm sure. Which doesn't surprise us. I mean, you know, when when you have a job, and I think about it, if you have a waiter job, bartender job, a small like you know whatever job that is, and you're getting paid hourly or on tips, and you don't bring, and you got to pay for gas, and you got to, I mean, self storage is on the bottom of that list of important things. So I think when you look at the demand, if we're going to see occupancy pull back it's going to be you know renters that can't pay it's renters that decide they don't need it um i think that's really the like the main factors that i see i don't know if jeremiah or pete have yeah pretty- our sweet spot yeah with, with that question i think that uh our sweet spot's really the middle lower not low low income but low income middle income um not not too much of the upper income and um Believe it or not, I mean, it is just the nature of, of the business, but uh, the, the least proactive, so ve- they're very reactive to the market. And that actually, to me, what I've seen on the operation side is a, is a blessing in, in the sense of there's not a lot of rate shopping. It's really, you know, there's either, you know, people are moving in with them or they need to move quickly or they're, you know, outgrown or, or they can't afford their space anymore and they need it now. So the thing on our side is just oversupply. Like we just really keep make sure I think, you know, supply drives rates on our end too, just as much as demand. And and we're worried. We don't know where it's going to shake out, but there's a lot of new starts out there. So we're just very cognizant of markets where there's a lot of new starts. And that's where we're most worried, because, you know, I think storage at the end of the day is really about price and convenience. That's it. No, there's no brand loyalty at all. I mean, it's like, you know, they call, what's your rate? Where, how far is it from me? So then, you know, do we get in a pricing war? Yeah, if there's five facilities in our market going on at once. So I would be cautious with, with anyone out there, you know, be very careful what markets you're getting into because, you know, it's a pain to build, but, you know, barriers to entry are, are everything. Like if, if you, if there's high cost of land, if there's strict zoning requirements, if, you know, it's not conducive to develop, you know, those are the, and you're around residential, those are really all you need to make a successful storage project or an existing facility. But if there's availability everywhere and it's easy to get in, uh, rates, be careful, rates are going to stay low. Yeah, that's, that was, if you look at Nashville, Dallas, Denver, Florida for a while, Raleigh, you know, Charlotte, those markets were really soft because they were overdeveloped right before COVID, you know, before COVID is, we saw that spike of development and now there's more supply on the market than there is demand. And, and especially when you have two properties leasing up against each other, it, that, that or even three sometimes in Florida where it's just a race to the bottom on your rates until you finally fill up and then you can do it. Um, it's like I had a, an, a developer here in town who built one right down from our office and 280,000 square feet came on the line pretty much the same time. Two other big developers you know, knocked down a park, drew up, blew up 90,000 square feet. And then another developer built two sites and rates went from a buck 40 to, you know, $65 for a 10 by 10. And, you know, and it was just a matter, it took an extra year and a half to hit the bottom. Everybody filled up and then everybody raised rates. Now it's great. And that same way, all those Nashville, you look at Nashville, Florida, Denver, those marks are booming now, but two years ago, people were very bearish on them and now they're, they're bullish. And just to comment on what Brad said there, what we're trying to be proactive in the sense of in suburban markets, we notice there's more demand for bigger units. So those bigger units, you know, uh, in your your weighted average of your rent per square foot drive your rent per square foot down. Right. You don't get the benefit of having all the small units as a big multi-story climate control. So you when you you better underwrite a little bit lower rates because we've noticed bigger units are, are in more demand. And then what we're doing is being proactive in terms of developing product that isn't homogenous with the rest of the marketplace. So we're, we're doing some 12 foot wide units, you know, so people can back trailers in. We're making sure we have the nine foot six doors on the 10, six high buildings. You're paying just a couple bucks more, but people perceive it as, you know, more cubic footage, which it is, you know, it's, it's a bigger space, even though it's the same dimensions. Plus, you know, doing some uh, lights in inside each units, trickle chargers, you know, some climate control stuff or some different things for businesses. 
So we, we really want to get ahead of it now. And maybe it, it, it hits our pro forma where we can't have tons of five by tens, 10 by tens. And then you can drive your rents through the roof because they're such small units. We'd like to have a differentiator in there. And then the good thing is you can always add demising walls if you, if you, de, you know, design it right. Yeah. We can put it down the road. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a yeah. good value add, not only for your consumers, it's a good value add when you decide to sell your portfolio, if you decide yeah. to sell your portfolio. So go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That, that's right. I was going to say, yeah, I, th I think Brett and Jeremiah hit on the two factors that I see that can affect occupancy. Uh, one's on a more market-based level, right? You get that development. If, if you get 100,000 square feet coming out of the ground two miles away, that's going to have an effect on your occupancy. The more macroeconomic one that Brett also touched on, though, is inflation, right? We Everybody likes to tout how uh, storage is a great inflationary play, and that's right. Um, but with inflation, budgets can tighten, right? Wages have moved, obviously, recently all across the board, but they don't move necessarily quite as fast as, as costs. So like Brett said, gas is going up, groceries are going up, rent's going up, all that stuff's going up. So st that's where I think you see sort of on a on a macro scale where you see some pressure on, on occupancy. Yeah. I don't and that, mind. And just, just one thing on that. It's yeah, just it's so right now with, with uh, <laughs> Brett's team and Pete, they, they, these guys underwrite things to a T like right down to the dime. The thing is that you better be prepared in that transition in the marketplace for your economic occupancy to decrease because, you know, if you're just hiring a third party manager, I mean, I'm, we self-manage and just probably because we're just control freaks that we don't trust every <laughs> everything, you know, and ever someone else to do it. But what we we really want to we notice you got to in those conditions with certain demographics, you got to collect. So, you know, don't underwrite a deal if, if things are pivoting right now, which we believe they are in terms of maybe we're in, we're maybe we're already in a recession, you know, and it's tight to pay the bills. You know, you're not going to stabilize is not 95, 98 percent collections. You know, give yourself a little more of a buffer, you're not going to collect every dime every, and you might need to give them more concessions. So your stabilized value might be 90 or 88 percent. But right now, everything looks rosy. Everybody's underwriting things like your, you know, 95, 97 percent uh, collections and it's no problem. And that, that's on our end. That's just not realistic over the long haul of the business. It's going to be tough for, for people to pay. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would agree. A, a friend of mine posted the other day on Facebook, like this, this economy is going to wipe out middle class. And I'm like, it, it's it's looking that way if things don't take a shift here soon. So uh, we do have another question from the audience. I'm going to pop up here. This is from Tom Bowen with expected lower abilities to raise sure. rental rates and the increased cost to develop a new site. What do you see happening in terms of future developments over the next three to five years? I still think you're going to see the develop. Actually, I, I'm seeing the shift in the development just because of where we're selling these price per square foot. Like we just sold one in Nashville for $411 a foot, sold one in South Florida for $600 a foot. I mean, those are the higher ones, but still Florida, $200 a foot, you know, and now we've seen the cost of development go from, I mean, when I first got into it, you're building single stories for 30, 40 bucks all in a foot. And then it got up to like 65 and then 75 and then 85. Now you're out 100 bucks, you know, 90 to 100 bucks, 115 bucks a foot for like your basic single story, like small office, like basic, basic, basic. Mm -hmm. And those multi stories went from 80 bucks a foot to 100 to 130. Now you're 150 to 200 a foot, depending on you know the cost of the land too. So we're seeing those go up, but you're also seeing everybody look at the values that we're selling these price per square foot and going, you know. I can build it for cheaper. And that's, I think, driving people. You know, we had a portfolio in Detroit where we had offers in about 270 a foot, you know, and public storage, they're very big on basis. And they said, look, I can build them for, we can build them for cheaper. You know, they can build it for half of that cost, you know, for what they think they can, or, you know, maybe a little over half. And so I don't think it's actually going to slow down any, if anything, I think it's going to ramp up just because of what everybody's seeing on the other side. And it's like Jeremiah said, my biggest concern is those people oversaturating when you got somebody building right next to someone else. And it's like we're laying them on top of each other. This isn't the Burger King McDonald's model where it's like you could be across the street or an apartment. Like, you know, not that I'm that versed in apartments, but if there's a really nice apartment and it's full, and I want to build another one right beside it. But I'm going to have a nicer movie theater or pool or whatever. Like there's an actual experience when it comes down to like me paying a little more to go over here. It's like Jeremiah said. Cost and convenience, what I always say. I mean, safety and all, you know, some of those things, the 
those factor in just a little bit, but cost and convenience are the two most important things in self-storage. And if it's $65 to rent over here and it's 85 over here, they're going to go to 65 unless it's completely like, you know, trash compared to the nice, you know, so sure. that's the, that's, I think people are going to start going that direction because it is hard to, you know, compete with guys like Pete when you're buying a deal and, and you know, Pete obviously has to battle with some of the, you know, other institutional buyers that are out there. I mean, it's very, very competitive on the acquisition side. You know, when I get people call me and say, I mean, I get probably three to five calls a week. I've always wanted to be in self storage and, and I'm talking, you know, multi-million dollar funds, you know, hundred million dollar funds and, or the guy, the dentist who has a half a million bucks. And, you know, it's almost like good luck because the, the, <laughs> the landscape of trying to get in it right now is very, very difficult. And, you know, like KKR was telling me yesterday, they took a deal from LOI to close in 35 days. You know, that's like, if you're competing against that, that can be difficult, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. so it's a, when you start having that frustration of trying to buy a deal, you finally look at it and say, well, they're selling for 250 a foot. I can build it for 140. It may take a little extra time, but I'm going to get more return. If, there is, if you do build the biggest profit, like profit maker, in my opinion, right now in opportunity and self-storage is developing. But I warn you, everybody out there, it's not that easy to build self-storage. It's not like check three boxes. This is good. Saturation is below seven. You know, there are a lot more things that go into developing self-storage. And it, you've got to go in it with caution and have patient money and have patience in general. Because like I say, it takes you six, eight months to get it zoned and titled. It takes you eight to 12 months to build it. You know, you're over a year, you, I mean, really a year and a half. And then they always say like 12 to 24 months to fill it. Realistically, you know, it, it's probably two to th three years. You're, you know, if year one, you're going to be 65. Year two, you're going to be full, but your rents are going to be lower. And year three, you're going to get everybody's rents up. Well, you add the, those three years onto the year and a half to get it zoned and developed, you're four and a half years. And that's a big window of liability if this market does shift, if you do have a competitor go in against you, because that's another year. So all of a sudden, it's, it's not as easy as you think. But when you see these guys that are like build them, and, you know, two years later, they sold them and they made, you know, eight million, they tripled their money, doubled their money. It's not that simple, but a lot of people are going to see it. A lot of people are going to go through it because they see that as being the biggest value add because it's hard to build value on the acquisition side right now, given as competitive the landscape is. Sure. Yeah. Pete, Jeremiah, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think in the next three to five years, you know, as Brett said, with a four and a half year life cycle, which I think is pretty accurate, you know, those people are making decisions today. Are they, are they building or not? So I think it's a good time frame for Tom's question. <clears throat> and I think, you know, right now, I think the big factor is rates, right? Rate, rate per square foot that you can, that you can get uh, from customers and, and rate per square foot that people are buying these things at. And certainly over the past six, 12, 18 months, those have just been skyrocketing. So I think a lot of people have started to, you know, get those entitlements, put shovels in the ground right now based on that relatively recent history. And, you know, <clears throat> the pace at which that continues, I think is going to depend a lot on what the next six, 12 months looks like. Uh, but those those projects that are in in process, I mean, they're they're certainly going to keep going. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, for sure. I, I agree. I think um, a few things to that. What I mean, Brett's spot on. Like that you better have that realistic timeline and very patient money. Um, <laughs> my ex, I think the way I see it, from and once again, there's different tiers of storage, right? You have the you have multi-story uh, institutional grade assets in cities. To me, those make me the most nervous. I mean, maybe I have a positive bias to you know, suburban markets and with the COVID effect of people moving out there. So if, if your listener wants to, put, to me, be a little more cautious, you know, doing a single story project where you get in the land under a million bucks and you can build it, you know, at a reasonable price, I think you're a little more insulated to risk. I think those markets might have a lot of permits pulled, but I think those are the most cautious buyers. A lot of them are contractor guys or their local guys that maybe when if lending gets a little tight those permits are going to sit there and they're they're risk adverse so maybe you could pick up some permits that we're hoping in the next few years where people just they don't really follow through with the project we bought a few of those already and then on the the other side in terms of it's crazy because you know i've heard and these guys deal with bigger markets than me but you know in, in seattle like you know with the, the the amount of per capita they have when i went up the extra space doing their underwriting conference a few years ago they're they just posting flags they're like we don't care 
we're going to build or, or these developers and they get they'll build as much as they can saying we're, we're going to put it here now and um and it's going to fill and we don't care anyway because our cost basis is we have the money that we have available here to be patient and just set our basis right now and, and have this asset here um we're, we're gonna we're gonna do whatever it takes and, and, and I, that's scary to me because as the small guy you know where you're building a 10 or 15 million dollar facility in a, in a class a market um you know that's that's a, you get that's a long lease up that's a high interest payment on your debt and and if you have competitors that have deep deep pockets that can like brett was saying drop rates and and just keep going you know, they can just keep adding concessions and you see that web only rate can drop down to like 10 or 20 percent of what the, the market rate is. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like, you know, I, I want to slap myself because I had to do 10 deals in order to make the amount of profit. I saw some of the guys that I know in South Florida do on one deal. CFO, they build it. CFO dumped it, made 10 million bucks. I had to buy a bunch of facilities in the middle of nowhere in Maine to make 10 million bucks, you know, <laughs> for four years. So I'm like, ah, I could have done one of those, but you know, hey, it all worked out. But I don't know about that in the future. You know, I that's uh that's rolling the dice a little too long for me to just expect you're gonna build it and then you're gonna generate you know a massive profit at C of O. I think those it's gonna be a little bit of a battle in those bigger facilities and big markets. Yeah, it's like it's it's like high limit, it's like a high limit, the high limit room versus like I, I, I agree with you. When I look at developing, am I gonna go buy something for Eight hundred thousand dollars, and you could even phase it in. And you know, if things go awry, you're, you're breaking even, or you have to feed it. It's not as much. When you go down in Florida and you're buying dirt for two and a half, three million bucks, and then you're building a multi-store, you're in it for twelve million dollars. Your carry is much worse. Like you know, every people don't realize back in you know two thousand and eight. I don't think we're going to go to a recession like that, where banks shut off. And but if you have you know things go a little slower than, and you got to feed this thing. And it takes an extra year. I mean, people lost deals or, you know, it, so the, everybody thinks it's going to be great and you do make the biggest money on the high limit stuff, but it also is the biggest game of, you know, roulette. If things slow down and you're in the middle of that cycle of developing, you know, it could be troublesome. So it, it's, you know, you have to make sure. And sometimes you don't have control of that. You could have the greatest spot. I had a client in Sarasota who just had it. And it was a great location. Tammy, Amy, I'm like, you know, like you're getting the dirt for a good price. The price of the dirt went up a little bit. The construction went up a little bit. Boom, neighbor comes in right across. The guy's got a permit for going for zoning right across the street. If he gets it, I don't know if I like the deal anymore. And I still think, listen, if you got super patient money and you can wait it out another, you know, maybe five years before you make money, but it's going to be a great deal at some point, but it may be five years. So if you need to get that money quick, it might not as be as easy to sell out at CO or to get a cash flow as quick. Yeah, for yeah sure. the, other, the other thing when you talk about what that, what that looks like right on an exit right if if your if your plan is to sell at co or an early lease up you know most buyers for that not to take everything back to debt but you know you're typically going to end up with floating rate debt in most cases on on a deal like that and you know in today's environment that's that i would say that's risky right i mean so not only are you factoring in a higher interest rate out of the gate but you have to adjust your price to factor in that risk over the next couple of years until you can lease it up, stabilize it and, and get it on permanent debt. Yeah. It, just to hammer that point with those two guys is like, if you want to know one thing in storage that all the only thing you need to focus on with development, like <laughs> before even cost to build rates, like you just hammer in rates. Basically all you're buying is a rate that a, a revenue, a rent uh, revenue rates. That's it. So, you know, a, a multi-story that, that swing is huge. You can have, you know, a project makes sense at $18, $19 in aggregate of your rents, your annual rents. As soon as that hits 15, the whole thing falls apart. So that if there's sensitivity to rates, uh, um, like it's just that, that is a ticking time bomb. If your rates go down on multi-story stuff, it's just a compounded effect. You don't really see that too much in small single story stuff way out in the middle of, you know, the, sub the suburbs. I mean, you'll have a little bit of drop, but you know, you're not you don't you're not banking on massive, massive rates. You know, typically we're underwriting it where there's you know, you, you might be a little above market. But the the, the uh, multi story stuff, though, the rate sensitivity is huge. Yeah. And you yeah. think about it like and that's why I think radius plus not to plug them, but like or, or something to understand yeah. where rates have been. That's the hardest. That's what like when you look at this, you're you're taking a piece of paper and you're making a deal work. And you're and, you know, that's why I think it's important to understand where rates have been, because. 
Yeah. You could look at it in January and it wouldn't make sense. You could look at it in July and it does make sense. So you got to plan on the worst and hope for the best. But like that rate movement, you know, you, by the time you figure it out, by the time you learn, by the time you open their door and you figure it out, like that's why the developers are, you know, the, the bold, most bullish people, like the biggest, you know, you know what's like out there in the market is those people who can do that because you're guessing where the rates are going to be two and a half years down the road. And I saw people were penciling stuff in like 16 that came out that softened, it softened up in 19, 18, 20, you know? And then right now I've seen it where they penciled it down here and all of a sudden, you know, they opened a year ago and right now they're booming, you know? So you never know where you're going to be and you don't find out until it's too late. Cause if you open those doors and it's a little slower, you, it's not, all you can do is drop your rates. That's it. Yeah. And, and why, I guess to clarify what I was saying to Brett's point is that, if, if you have a scale, the size on the project, if you're at 100,000 to 120,000 rentable square feet, that rate amplified is a huge uh, repercussion on the project. So, and, it, and it's a, a double-edged sword. I mean, you can make a ton of money if the rates exceed what your expectations are because you have 100,000 rentable square feet. But, it, you know, it, it's not, so that's all. It's just when you have those big, big projects, every move in the rate, you know, amplifies it that much more on how much you, you're going to make or lose on the project. I think. Especially when I see guys that take a deal that should be 60, 70,000 square feet and it doesn't quite pencil or pay a little too much for the dirt. This deal went up all of a sudden. It was like, let's put another 10,000. You know what? I can put a whole other floor on. Let's go to another 25,000. All of a sudden, now you put 100,000 square feet where you only needed 60. And so you have 40,000 extra square feet that's going to sit vacant. You got to carry, you know, and selling those at CO is very difficult. Like, 75, 80,000 square feet. I, you know, there are a lot of guys out there who will buy 120, 140,000 I've seen. And it's like, that's a fine year lease up. And that might even be stabilized, you know, and some of those. And, but, you know, I also have been hearing the, this now than ever. It's like, man, I wish I would have just built a little bit more because everybody's doing so well right now. But it's, you know, depends on the time you catch it. Yeah. Yeah. That, I totally agree. I think that five to seven acre range where you can get single story. And you can get like uh, fifty to seventy-five, eighty thousand rentable. That's that. You know, I I don't think that's a too big of a hurdle to overcome. And you can keep it leased up. Uh, you're you can make the project pencil. And I think single story. This is just me looking at the customers that we deal with. I mean, you're always gonna have a, a competitive edge to drive up single story convenience, right? If if any, I guess the rule of thumb is that you don't want a, a customer walking more than one hundred fifty feet to get to their unit. You know, and I live in Vegas. I, I had a third floor unit once and it's it's pain in the ass, right? You just got to get up and down and do the whole deal. And, you know, so I think having that single story product, you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to maximize every single dime out of the development, but you're going to be able to keep it full and you're going to be able to uh, compete against all the other uh, competitors that might be just building on pro forma. Yeah, for sure. Well, for sake of time, because we're we're almost at the, the end of this. I mean, gosh, we didn't even make it halfway through all the questions that we had planned. Um, so I wanted to talk about just some closings. And I, I looked at our poll responses, and it looks like a decent amount of people in the audience here today um, either currently own or are looking to own. So quick little wrap up here, if we could just rattle through some of like the things that they should be looking for when it comes to closings, maybe some of like the things that are most over that get missed the most in closings to try to help them mitigate through this process. Because for a lot of our audience today, this probably is their first deal process that they're going through. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously it starts in the front end of the due diligence. It's mm -hmm. doing the lease audit and making, you know, making sure that some people go through every single lease during their audit. Some people do spot checks is making sure that's in there, getting your property condition report, you know, having a third party do it and make sure, you know, and right now you can't retrade on any of that stuff. It's just more know what you're getting yourself into. And, you know, like I had a buyer, we were doing a deal in, in Mississippi and there's like water, it's moisture issues. I mean, five years ago, they'd have been like, whoa, 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 we got to talk. And the seller, and, and the funny part is, sellers, honestly, I don't think I even want to sell anyway. So if you want to if you don't want to cancel the deal, I'm fine. And they're like, no, we're fine. What is good? So understand necessarily like doing that for a retrade, but doing that because you know what you got to deal with when you open the when you get into the asset. I think having a clean contract with the proration set that, you know, I I typically tell people, like, listen, anything outside of 30 days that's in like that's due to you, that's in or you know, that's late payments or whatever, 
Mm-hmm. That typically is is not coming in. You know, that's just lost. The inside 30 is 75 percent ish, depending on which way you want to move it, goes to the buyer because that those people will collect. Um, but I think that's you know having that that is important in, in the process. And I'll let these guys chime in on other little aspects of their process. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. I, mean, I think doing your diligence right, starting it early, because you know I think Brett mentioned earlier one way that people are trying to be more competitive is shortening due diligence timeframes. So as a buyer, you have to be willing to start that diligence early, right? Start spending some dollars to to get that stuff rolling ahead of time, so that you're prepared to hit the ground running and and your reports are already in process by the time you're under contract. Um, so I think that's one big thing. And then the other thing is just sort of staying on top of it, right? You can't just assume that once you have the purchase agreement signed that you can step back and show up in, you know, 30, 45 days and and pay the money and it's done. You got to stay on top of everything. You got to stay on top of lenders, stay on top of third parties. And I, I think preparedness is the, is the best thing because, you know, as far as missing things at closing, that doesn't often happen, right? It's just going to be a problem at closing. So you're not usually going to miss it. Somebody's going to catch it, but it's just, do they catch it? with two weeks or, or a month left, or do they catch it with a day left and now you're trying to, to put out a fire? Yeah, sure. Not a yeah. fun spot to be in, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that I agree with those two guys where, where really it's um, right now with the market so competitive, even even with what's going on, uh, it, timing is is key, right? Because if you don't have your ducks in a row, like Pete's saying, where you know everyone's so slow right now, so get your phase one order, get your Alta ordered, Get an Alta, you know, really just do it, pay the extra money, you know, get the full engineering uh, on your survey. So you see the, the bound, not only the boundary lines, you're right, your entitlements, encroachments, easements, everything right there on your Alta. I've, I've made tons of mistakes in the beginning, right? I didn't get them, you know, we had encroachments, I had easements going through the property. And then also, you know, getting your bank lined up, it's slow. You know, appraisals are slow. Pay the extra money up front, get the four to five week turnaround. It's probably going to take longer anyway. But, you, you know, really have your financing lined up and, and make sure you hit your timing. And then what Pete was saying is go make sure you have communication with the seller or the broker. You know, it can't hurt when I'm selling something. I want to know, OK, you know, just be proactive. Don't don't in a week before the close and go, oh, you know, it got delayed. You know, that's pretty unprofessional right? at this stage. Just saying, hey, we hit these different we hit these different uh, milestones. We might be a little bit late here, but it really you know allows someone to have confidence that you're going to execute on what you're doing. And then on the other side, on for closing wise, if uh, or or through the closing process, if you're going to get into something and you want to do development, and I don't want to turn it into that uh, right now. You better build a lot of time into your your permitting period, like Brett was saying. So you know we have an LOI template where if you put right out of the gate, you want six months time, you know, a free look at the property. People are you know land selling just like assets. They're going to say, no way, we're not going to give you the time to get this thing permitted. But if you can phase it out where you say, you know, zero to 60 days, I'm going to invest the money into my engineering, my survey, especially if they didn't do the work and get the, the engineering or survey done uh, you know, on the site conditions and wetland delineation. So if you do you say, hey, I'm investing in that zero to 60 days, give me 60 to 120 to review it and submit something to the town. And then from 120 to 180, you know, give me the time to permit it. Plus, you know, I can release deposits to get a little longer time. It's a little more palatable and professional than just, you know, saying, hey, give me six months free look and then you know, people just sit on it and don't do anything. So you really have to understand. And then and then also on that, don't don't try to rezone uh, a, a site. You know, if make sure it's in the commercial zoning that has storage as an approved use. And now pretty much every municipality is requiring a special use permit. We still got to go submit your project and get in front of the town and then everyone gets to speak up and give, share their opinion about your project. But at least you're not rezoning it and you're against completely against the tide. So that those are just two key points when you're tying up land and you really want to develop versus acquire. And I'll say one la- and I'll say one last thing real quick yeah, is is for the first time people out there is uh, like 30 day due diligence isn't feasible anymore with these third parties they're slower. So I would say you would want to be prepared for 45 days. If you ask for 60, there's no way the only to do it right now. A lot of times you can go 30 days on the due diligence and then 45 for the third party reports. And then you can close, you know, they'll, they'll be more lenient after that. But understand if you want to be competitive in the market, that's what I would I would recommend. 
and, and have a good team, right? The whole thing's lined up where if, if you're new to the game, you know, reach out to Jess, right? To get a, like, you know, we like Newmark title. They do a great job for us, but, you know, I'd rather have a, a professional title insurance company. You know, you want a good, uh, I, I, we use a loan broker that um, that's from Ohio that, uh, that uh, Brett, Brett's team introduced me to a long time ago. Uh, his name's Alec Meacham. So I'm just, I'm not plugging these guys per se, but, you know, in the beginning, use professionals, you know, and also an attorney, a transactional attorney that gets it, that just, you know, you want these people ahead of time. So you're not just trying to find someone to fill the void, you know, halfway through the transaction where, you know, you, these people are busy too. You know, they, they, you, you got to have this lined up when you're doing your acquisition so you can hit your timing. Yeah, for sure. Well, guys, I feel like we could have probably went for two, three hours on this one. <laughs> I mean, this could have been like a four-hour workshop on uh, this particular topic. Uh, but we have run out of time, unfortunately. Thank you all so much for being here. And before I wrap up completely, um, I have two quick announcements for the audience, so stay tuned. If you're a self-storage owner operator, the SBOA 2022 Knowledge is Power Conference is for you. The SBOA has partnered with industry experts to discuss new technologies, solutions, and opportunities in the self-storage industry. This two-day virtual event will offer panel discussions, breakout sessions, networking opportunities, and more. Don't miss out on great presentations and knowledge. Save the dates of June 1st and 2nd, and let's unpack. Thanks for sticking around and watching those two quick video ads. That is right. We have a new program from the SBOA called Storage for Rookies. Our sister company, Storage Pros Management, throughout the last 25 years, we have built, acquired, and sold a portfolio of well over 100 locations. So we feel we're pretty versed in this topic, and we want to help new owners and operators that are coming into the industry get started and get started on the right foot right path and not make the same mistakes that we made many, many years ago. Um, so our next one is on May the 12th. It is from 12 to 5 p.m. Again, that's storage for rookies, 12 to 5 p.m. on May the 12th. And then our virtual national conference, uh, the Knowledge is Power conference is coming up on June 1st and June 2nd. Both days will be from, I believe it's Okay, wait, I said it wrong. Rookies is 12 to 5. Knowledge is Power Conference is 1 to 5.30. I should know these things. I'm planning these suckers, but crazy the world going on over here at the SBOA. So we hope to see you guys at those events. Registration details are live for the May 12th Storage for Rookies event. And then the June 1st and June 2nd National Conference, we should have registration details out uh, to the masses probably by the end of this week, early next week. It's a very minimal ticket. It costs $30 for two-day access pass or you can come to day one or day two for just 20 bucks. Highly recommend that you do. Join us next week, Thursday, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo for another self-storage unlock. This one is called How to Dominate Your Local Market Against Your Competitors. It's got a good operations and marketing theme, which is my wheelhouse. Uh, so hope to see you guys next week. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend and the rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>